and we'll uh, we'll kick this little thing off there. Great. Hello, Jonathan. Also, uh, hi, Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan, Armin Shimmerman. Armin Shimmerman, Jonathan. Jonathan's connecting to audio. Paul Powers is actually there as well. So that's great. We're almost set and ready to go. <laughs> Excellent. OK, well, the time has arrived where we can welcome back for his second visit to the Madrid Drive because his first one was frankly so awesome. There's just so much joy and happiness to be packed into this. The scholar, of course, who is responsible for uh, Dr. John D, variety of other sort of packages as well. He is, in fact, the man who is behind the Trek Against Trump camp campaign. We didn't even work through that last time, but what success that was. We say welcome once again, Armin Shimaman. How are you, Armin? I'm very fine. Thank you. And thank you for that introduction. Always a delight to connect with your good self. And, and how has the voice work been going over the last few days, Armin? Because I, I gather you, you were working in all sorts of other areas recently. Uh, I've had some voice work over the course of this week and over the course of the pandemic. Actually, it's the only part of our industry that seems to be thriving. Everything else is uh, jumps and, and stops, uh, depending on who gets sick on the set and that sort of thing. So voiceover work, you go into a, a booth by yourself, you get direction over your, your headphones and uh, hopefully you give them the product that they want. Well, and, and I know, Armin, you being the consummate professional, you will do that in every way, shape or form. So that, that's always critical from that perspective. Um, we spent the first time obviously talking about the fantastic world of Illyria um, and uh, the way in which that's well worth accessing. I mean, I have to say, and I'll quote from C.S. Lewis here when he was referring to uh, the importance of being able to revisit texts and actually work through that. He often said that sometimes he found texts, uh, if, you, if you didn't actually find sufficient things that were hidden in there to revisit them, you would read them once and then that's it. But rereading Illyria, well worth accessing. So again, if you haven't already done so, go and get hold of a copy of Illyria by Armin Schumann. There we are. That's the initial plug done at the start. Please, which is important. with my American accent, I'm going to call it Illyria. Well, yeah, this is it. I mean, because I'm glad you said that. Illyria, Illyria, always very difficult. Hopefully, we've now been joined by Jonathan Lindsley. Jonathan, how are you, sir? You, not, you might have muted yourself, Jonathan, because we could see you moving your lips, but couldn't actually hear anything there. Who knows what strange things could be happening in this side. But Paul Powers is with us. Paul, how are you, sir? I'm, I'm good, gents. How are you doing? Are you OK? Can you hear me? Yes, yes except just it's barely, very, though. You, you you, 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 thank you, Armin. He is very quiet. Maybe he's plugged something in there. Notice, Armin, he's wearing his headphones. He just hasn't plugged <laughs> in there. Maybe you need to be closer to the microphone. I don't know. It's very weird. Jonathan, can you actually one. hear us now? I can now hear you. I've been Excellent. struggling to get into the meeting. I've been struggling to hear anything. I've been, I, you know, I'm obviously well, technically looking, challenged. Yeah, you've been looking as bemused as we've come to know and appreciate, just as Graham Harper, our BAFTA award-winning director, often sort of has to deal with bemused actors when they say, you want us to do what, <laughs> Graham? You want us to do what for you? You want us to do this on this particular thing? Graham, can I uh, How many introduce takes you? Do you need? How many takes? <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> Hello, Armin. Hello, how are you, Graham? I'm very, very well. Nice to meet you. Is it that cold where you are? No, but until it gets really warm, I'm going to stay like this. <laughs> Armin, you should know now the difference between Los Angeles, California and Britain is that and we always like to keep our woolens on until at least June. <laughs> well, I, I have experienced a lot of cold weather in the UK, but uh, usually it's further north. Uh, it's uh, up towards uh, Scotland. Uh, well, Ooh, there, there that's you. cold. Graham, we'll, we'll turn to you first. Um, any questions you'd like to put to Armin? Because I know you've never actually worked with uh, with Armin as yet, but uh, anything you'd like to sort of throw in at this particular juncture? As I've got so much. Um, look, when I was a kid, I used to, st I've, and I've done this all my life, I stay in the cinema, I watch all the credits roll until the very last beat and the last name and the, and the logo that comes up for Universal or whoever it is, until it goes. Uh, and one of the characters that I remember as a young kid, um, and to this day, because I saw you in an interview talking about, uh, uh, well, not Bud Westmore, but Bud Westmore was a very famous makeup artist. Yeah, and then you suddenly are started are working with a, a, a guy, I think I'm just looking at his name, uh, Mark, was it? Michael. Michael, Michael. Michael and, Westmore. And um, he is Bud's brother. It's extraordinary. Well, I mean, that's that's history. That's uh, that's royalty. That's extraordinary. It is indeed royalty on the on the lot of Universal here in Los Angeles. There's a Westmore building uh, made out not just to <laughs> Bud and Michael, but to their dad, who was the original 
was the originator of the uh, of the uh, franchise of the uh, what do you call it um, dynasty. It's extraordinary, uh, you know, because we don't have that here. Um, you will have famous makeup artists renowned doing uh, wonderful makeups and, and designing great uh, prosthetics or whatever, but we don't have a dynasty. Uh, well, not to my knowledge. That's extraordinary, and it re that really, when I heard you talking. I thought, gosh, that took me back to, to the, the 50s when I was a little kid watching, and Bud, West, Bud Westmore's name used to go up very, very, a lot. It was extraordinary. He did a lot of stuff, but he, he was following in the footsteps of his father. Michael followed in the footsteps of his family. Michael has won a countless amount of Emmys. I don't know if he's won any Oscars, but he certainly has, I think it's somewhere around 27, 28 Emmys for his makeup work. I'm sure Bud has quite a few awards himself. But again, the Westmore family is, uh, as you say, royalty or dynasty uh, uh, here in, um, in our industry. Oh, it's extraordinary. Um, one of the other questions I wanted to ask you about was, um, Alexis and others will know that I, I'm, I'm really hot about this. We don't rehearse anymore in this country, uh, in television. Uh, well, I, I say I, I have not rehearsed a scene outside of the studios for three or four days before going to production um, since probably the 19, early 1990s. Um, that was all cut out, save money. Um, the directors and the actors get together for five minutes before we do a scene because we work to a really tight budget in this country. And um, we're supposed to put it all together, um, each scene, and show the crew, and then we get on with shooting it, and an hour and a half later, we've got a scene. Um, how do you feel about that? I don't like it uh, because I come from the theatre where we get a, a month, maybe six weeks to rehearse. So I, I don't like it. It's one of the reasons I in my later years, if I can call them those, uh, have gone back to the theater as opposed to doing a lot of TV. Um, I will tell you that because I didn't like it, when we were doing Star Trek, um, I was able to convince all my fellow actors who worked with me in my scenes primarily, would come over to my house for the weekend and we would rehearse at Sans Director um, and, and provide uh, options, choices, that we might present to the director, we left it to him or her to make their choices, but we had rehearsed it for the weekend so that we would be ahead of the curve, mainly because most of us had theater background and knew how important rehearsal is. The idea to put something on tape without rehearsal, um, you're flying by the seat, you're very lucky if you get something very good. But we do it. But you do we it. We managed to do it. And, and God bless the editor uh, who's able to make sure that all the bad stuff is taken out. Um, but, but so much better when, um, when you've had a chance to rehearse. It's not so bad for the series regulars who know their characters very well. It's for the guest stars and the day players who all of a sudden are thrown into this mix and are in a world that they've never occupied before. So getting them up to speed is what I think is also very important. I'm just so grateful, Not gentlemen, we managed to have the, this rehearsal for this piece at, at least several weeks beforehand. Sorry, Graham. It's just it's nice that we actually worked on this one for the rehearsal. Otherwise, <laughs> we have all of those challenges there. I understand that. <laughs> I just want to ask, uh, talk about one more aspect of, of the rehearsal thing, and then and then I'm going to stop and let other people talk. Um, but the, the, what's throughout my whole career, Many times, I'm talking about in the 80s and 90s, as I was coming up through the, not the ranks, but through the ranks of directing, getting better and better work, as it were. Um, a lot of people that I work with, a lot of the technical DOPs and operators would sort of mutter, oh, I, I can't stand um, directing by committee, you know, why can't we? But in other words, they expected the director to be God. And God. But when you cut out rehearsals, you then have to cut out the rehearsal period before you go the three or four days before you're going to go into the studio. Um, you're then left with collaboration and a collaboration with the director and the actors. I have a great way of, I think, of how we're going to play this scene, but I want the actors to have their say. Um, and I've got to plan and work out I'm going to shoot it beforehand. And then they come along and, and luckily I'm in... Um, and I think other actors do exactly what you said. They get together, put a scene together themselves, and then they offer that to the director. And then there's a, if there's time, there's a chance to have five minute conversation um, where I can beg you not to do that. Or can we add this dimension? Or I'd love to do that. And I have to think on my feet. 
and change my shots and plans because what they're offering might be really so much better. Or what worse. do you think about yeah, that? I, I absolutely agree with you. And in our country, I don't know if it's true in England. Um, uh, I don't think it's as bad in England as it is in, in the United States. But oftentimes when you're shooting a television show, the, the cast, the main cast has done it many times. The crew has done it many times. The director of photography is a mainstay. He's always there, but the director is a guest and he's working with people that he hasn't worked with before or she hasn't worked with before. And um, he, has to, he or she has to make suggestions and hope that it fits in to um, uh, you know, the, the, the whole piece. And of course, as you must know, Graham, before you ever set foot on this, onto the stage, you have to have a long uh, discussion with the producers and the writers in order to get the tone of what they want from the show. And you have to do your homework and watch a number of the shows, including the pilot, to know exactly what the tone of the show is. Absolutely. Very collaborative, very collaborative. And all, as you say, done as quickly as possible. And isn't that wonderful? It is wonderful. And, and as my line producer once said to me many years ago, he said, when I was complaining about the lack of time, he said, that's why we pay you the big bucks. <laughs> we don't have that luck here, the big bucks. Well, oh. well, perhaps not, but, uh, but still, I'm sure it's a good living. Uh, it, it is. It, it works at a whole range of things. Jonathan, I can bring you in. Obviously, I, I recall a time we spent back in the in the 1990s, actually, shooting the proverbial breeze. And you were saying how you quite liked and you enjoyed Star Trek The Next Generation because we were working through that. This is, of course, when you were in the series Last of the Summer Wine. Since then, of course, as we know, you're on uh, Pirates of the Caribbean and so on. You've been listening to Graham and, and Armin talking about that. A any thoughts mm. from your own perspective? I mean, does that resonate at all? Oh, absolutely. Well, um, the lack of rehearsals does, and also working with people who've worked in the theatre, because if you work with a director who's worked in the theatre, they usually manage to find a moment to take you on one side and have some sort of rehearsal. Usually it's not even in a room, it's somewhere to the side of the, the set or whatever, but you can have that conversation. But I was, I'm intrigued by the, um, the idea that, yes, um, what Armin was saying about uh, people who've been um, <clears throat> regularly in a series, um, because I, my experience sometimes when I've come in as a guest on a television show or on a movie um, where there's a regular franchise uh, is that some of the actors who play the leading roles are almost undirectable. And I wondered how he felt about that. I, I have seen that, and that is a, a pain for the directors. Uh, sometimes they don't want to see you at all. Uh, <laughs> Uh, there is a hierarchy sometimes that you have to overcome when you're the guest. Uh, you're trying your very best to, to run as fast as they are, but they've been running for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a difficulty. Some, some, some guests uh, have it harder than others. But um, um, what I've often said to myself and to friends of mine who are starting out in the business, if your call is at eight o'clock, and usually that's rather late, get there at 7.30, get there at seven o'clock, yeah. Find out what the atmosphere of the set is like, who's yeah. friendly, who isn't, before you ever really have to show your face and do your stuff. Find out, suss out what exactly is the atmosphere, and then you'll be better prepared for when the attention is paid to you. That's pretty, that's pretty, pretty much the sort of advice that, that Jessica Burtis actually applies. She's always turning up early. She's always there. She, in many ways, is our Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Jessica, you've been listening to, to the team there, and welcome aboard from North Carolina. Obviously, you're fortunate enough to be on Armin's first midweek drive with us. Any other thoughts or, or, or considerations you'd like to throw into the mix? I think it's very interesting hearing how all of this works, because I think, like, from the outside, I, I wouldn't know this, but kind of about making productions. So if I could actually ask like a general question, what was like the experience the first time you all were like on a set or about to do like a project? My first time on a set, I was scared out of my mind. Scared <laughs> because I'd come from the theater, didn't know whether I could, uh, I could actually do what they needed. Um, uh, and of course it, it, it was a cultural difference as I've just <laughs> said, uh, you get maybe, at the most 10, 15 minutes to rehearse a scene. You do it once for yourselves and the director, then you do it for the camera crew. Then they send you off to makeup and uh, you get prepared while they're lighting the set. And, and you come back and all of a sudden the cameras are on and, and your, your stand-ins have, have 
uh, set up the blocking, you have to hit those marks. It, it's, a, it's a different world altogether than the theater. So I, I was quite terrified, but I was lucky to be on a, on a set for a long period of time when I started that had a lot of theater actors uh, in it. And they were very kind about nurturing me and mentoring me and, and understanding my qualms. That's my story. Jonathan. Oh, well, um, yes, I, I suppose I was lucky, actually, because um, my very first uh, television uh, on, a, on a set, um, I a, had rehearsals because in those days the BBC had rehearsal rooms at Acton and you spent a week in a rehearsal room with bits of wood and stuff that represented the set and, and the director. So I had proper rehearsals um, my very first time. But and also I was doing live television um, in the sense of going out in front of a live audience. So it was much more like a theater event. Um, so I stood on, uh, on my first set as a, as a, as a television actor and, and it felt like waiting backstage in a theater. So you walked out and, and suddenly switched it on as it were, which now that we don't have rehearsals and now that we don't have that time, um, it's a very different experience and it's very unusual to do a, a show in front of a live audience. Um, so you don't get that instant feedback that actors thrive on, which is when you get a laugh, you can time it because the audience are laughing for real. And if it's dubbed on laughter, you don't get that same feeling at all. So it's a, I think the world has changed so much now um, for all performers. But of course, young people, they've never experienced what I experienced at the beginning, which is what Graham was talking about, which is, you know, it gradually disappeared in the 90s, didn't it? That, that whole being yeah. able to rehearse and, and all that kind of stuff. So I would say my, my story is that I feel lucky that I learnt the business of television acting through theatre, basically, which was, yeah. you know, which is what Armin was saying is, is very useful. And I'm intrigued, Jonathan, you said bits of wood representing the director. Is that some sort of comment about the director's <laughs> yes. stand there? Yeah. That's yeah. Well. Well, it, yes. The bits, of, the bits of wood, I think, were... Um, they used to put doors in a door frame, yeah. but no wall. Yeah. So you'd open a door, but there was no... It was pointless. I mean, and you know... And, and, director, which is good. Well, yes. you pretended to open the door. Yeah, yes, it was yeah. two posts. You could have pretended... We could have mined the door. Do you know what I mean? It would have... Um, but yeah. they used to do this kind of build a set around. And it was just um, nominal things, like a table would be there in case. And then they'd say, this won't be the table on the day, but this is a table that represents a table. So just in case you can't imagine a table, <laughs> it's here. You know, that kind of stuff. But um, it was useful. I mean, you know, like rehearsal props, basically. Were you given props, Jonathan? Were, were you given props or did you have to mind the props? Uh, we were given some props if they were really important. Obviously, um, I did. Uh, when you, the way they worked it on the, um, on the, on the show that I was working on, uh, which was a comedy show, um, the filming was done uh, on location. And so we had real props and and really no rehearsals. So if you were driving a car, you were really in a car or if, you know, that sort of thing. But, um, and then all the interiors were done in studio in London um, six, five to six months later after the filming. Um, so that's how it, how it, it, was a, it was a very strange experience. I mean, I, I just assumed that that was the way everything was done. But of course, when I worked on other things, I found it wasn't. So it was different in drama, which I think uh, Graham will tell you it's, it's a very different experience from being on situation comedy. Yeah. And was, was that last of the summer wine, Jonathan, just to kind of make sure we're, we're on it, the same thing? Or was that was it, it a different it was, series? It, well, well, it was, it, yes, it was last of the summer wine. The, the, the first, that was the first series I did. Um, I actually appeared in something called The Hello Goodbye Man with David Nobbs before that, which was my very first television. But it was the same experience. I mean, the, exactly the same style Blocks of, of wood. thing. Um, yes, blocks of wood, rehearsals at Acton, that kind of stuff, yeah. Graham, you started as a child actor, and I know we, we've talked about the importance of actually having an experience. Can you can you cast your mind back? I know we've done this for our weekly show, <laughs> Sound and Director's Vision, but uh, just share with it. For the benefit of Paul Powers, who hopefully has sorted out his microphone, we'll be with him in a few seconds. Go for it, Graham. Um, yeah, I started um, uh, as a, a nine-year-old uh, going to drama school uh, as a kid to learn how to speak proper, like what my mother did. Um, and she she wanted me to have uh, she didn't want me to be an actor she wanted me to have voice production so eventually um, things progressed and I rather liked the idea of going to drama school gosh it was much happier than going to an ordinary school um, and I had a lot of laughs but I also 
worked a lot. I was never a child star. I was always a support of some sort, but I got a lot of work as a child up to the age of 16. And then it kind of eased off a bit. Um, and so I did all sorts of other things, nothing to do with um, theatre or film. The odd job came along, etc. I had to survive like most acting students. Um, and then eventually I changed and went into production. Um, I don't really remember the fear and nerve of... Um, my first studio days, for example, or the first time in the theatre, other than I was terrified of the theatre and loved film and television. Um, but the theatre is a necessary evil to an actor and also a true actor, which I probably wasn't, really, really wants to get out there and play from the beginning to the end a drama. Um, and that, that's the love of an actor, as far as I can see, and I believe in that. Um, but I, I, because in television in the late fifties that was the late fifties, there was rehearsal. So by the time you got into the studio as a young kid, I was in awe of everybody and looked around, um, loving every moment of being in this environment. But I don't remember. Well, it was live television too. I remember being terrified of live television, but I really enjoyed it. And by the time I got into television as a, 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 young, a, a young man, um, as an actor, I didn't have the fear. We had rehearsals, so it was fine. Gradually, when I went into production, um, I began to see that demise, really, of, of the rehearsal period, which I always felt was the most important. So I'm waffling on, but um, um, I... I I, I yearn for rehearsals. Yearning for rehearsals. Paul Powers, as an academic at the uh, at, uh, uh, the, the, the Joys of Anglia Ruskin, as somebody who's actually coordinated a Star Trek exhibition, tragically didn't feature Armin Shimmerman, invited over to Blackpool, otherwise it would have still been running, I'm sure, to this very oh, day. Absolutely. But, <laughs> Paul, what, what thoughts or questions have you got? And hopefully your microphone is now working. Yeah, can you hear me now, guys? Oh, I can am hear I, you, Paul. Hello, Paul. How are you doing? Um, it's, I, I just want to say what an honour it is to be here with so many wonderful people. Um, and, cool. and you, all, all, each of your stories have, have just been fascinating. I, I'm really grateful for that. Um, so, yeah, I do have a question. It's not directly related to Star Trek, actually. Um, but if, Armin, if you could cast your mind back 25 years um, to when um, you were on Seinfeld as uh, Stan the Caddy, <laughs> what was your experience, uh, you know, in, in that kind of uh, environment? You know, I, you probably get, get bombarded by uh, people asking you about Deep Space Nine. So I thought I'd mix it up a bit. You know, I'm obsessed with Seinfeld myself. Um, and Stan the Caddy is one of my favorite characters who, who really, um, you know, like uh, ru ruins the sort of the, the, the plot for, for the lawyer and everybody. Um, uh, <laughs> you know, they're, they're trying to get money from um, Sue Ellen Mischke. So. What, what was what was that experience like? Well, Paul, um, I don't want to ruin it for you, but we were <laughs> earlier about uh, different types of sets and uh, some are good and some are bad. That was a horrific experience. <laughs> the actors were non-communicative. They didn't want to rehearse. Uh, they, <laughs> they, uh, I was a guest. They were the regulars. They had no time for me. Uh, somebody mentioned to them that I was at that time uh, appearing on Star Trek. That didn't seem to matter to them at all. They didn't care. So I'm sorry, Paul, but that was one of the worst experiences oh, no. of my career. That oh, I it's extraordinary. Had. How <laughs> extraordinary. Oh, no, that's terrible. There are a, another 200 uh, shows you can pick from. Pick another one and I'll exactly. tell you. Yeah. Yeah. We, we had the joy of William Shatner on, on Boston Legal. We had obviously <laughs> Principal Snyder and Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Please don't say Sarah Michelle Gellar was difficult yeah. to work with. We oh, just... I love Oh, Sarah was one of the finest actresses <laughs> I ever worked oh, with. Oh, good. Do you know, I, I again, looking up your CV, uh, I, I mean, we don't know all the shows you've been in, but you've been in many, many, many shows. But the ones we, we will know, um, Hill Street Blues, Remington Steel, Ali McBeal, um, Cagney and Lacey. Oh, wow. Now, did you enjoy oh, any of those? I did. And those were, for the most part, all David Kelly shows. Uh, Boston Legal is a David Kelly show. Um, I, I worked a great deal for David Kelly. He was very kind to me and I loved those shows. They were great, they were wonderful people to work with both in front of the camera and behind the camera, uh, lovely directors. 
Um, those were terrific uh, institutions. And, and unfortunately for me, I began to become a, a much more recurring character on other shows. But um, so I didn't get to do as many out in the fields or, or the other shows or the practice um, because I was somewhere else. And, and that's one of the curses and, and, and blessings of being a, a constantly working actor is that you can't do all the shows that are offered you because there's not enough time in the day to be in two places at the same time. Yeah. yeah. Although there were days, there were days when I did both Star Trek and Buffy <laughs> on the same day. <laughs> But, uh, but those were few and far between. I well, just with the makeup, it must have been few and far between. Uh, the makeup was um, a, a, a blessing and a hindrance. It also, and Jonathan will understand this, it made for a lot of overtime, a lot of lovely <laughs> overtime. I, I may not have appreciated it at the time, but I do now. Um, but the makeup, uh, the makeup uh, was, but also, it was like wearing a lampshade at a party. It allowed me freedom <laughs> that perhaps I wouldn't have taken if it was just me without the make. It would Going be, back to, so it would be, can I just say it would be CGI now, wouldn't it? I mean, everything would be. It, it might be, Jonathan. Yes, you wouldn't might. probably have had any makeup. I know. I know. On when we did the pirates films, that uh, we were CGI characters. We 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 just wore a a, a grey suit with ping pong balls on it, and the computer <laughs> yeah. the computer made our faces, and all we had were eyes and teeth. That was a, the a mouth and eyes are the only bits of the that the animators can't do. So um, yeah, probably you, at, uh, at the you same would've, time you would have got less overtime now. <laughs> yeah, Quark or indeed Principal Snyder just wearing a grey suit with ping pong balls. It's not quite the same <laughs> thing, really. It wouldn't have worked, would it? No. No, but I had a beach ball on my head on, uh, for Star Trek, a little larger than a ping pong ball, but uh, which, by the <laughs> way, made me deaf. It's ironic that the, the, the character I played was supposed to be very good at hearing things, uh, but the reality was all of us that played Ferengi were deaf. The, the makeup, the beach ball, uh, 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 covered up our ears and therefore made it very difficult to hear. Did they make, gave, can I ask a question? Sorry, I just got one more question about makeup. <laughs> Jonathan. When, when, when they made, um, <coughs> when they made your, make, did you have a, a set set of prosthetics or did they make them new each time? Uh, yes and no. The, there were two parts to my makeup. Uh, one I always call the helmet and mm -hmm. that we reused weeks for weeks. And, right. and it was cleaned, but, but we, re, we reused that. The face mask that, that uh, covered nose and, and cheeks, um, that was made new every day. Right. Sorry, um, I was just interested. Jonathan and Armin, the, the, there's a, the sort of for and against that is, in Jonathan's case, where he was a pirate, but he was wearing a, a, just a grey suit with ping pong balls, there's no character there. You have to create a character totally. Whereas, I mean, you said in an interview, like Alec Guinness said, he put a hat on, the right hat, and he, the character came. You had the prosthetic uh, character. You, the character starts to form. You began to live and become a character. Jonathan, you, you had, didn't have that luxury. What, what they did with us um, to help the other actors who were humans uh, working with the monsters, as it were, um, or the, the aliens, um, was that um, they stuck a picture on our chest of the character so that, <laughs> so that Johnny uh, Depp or whoever it was you were fighting at the time could tell what you looked like or what you were going to look like. Because obviously <laughs> they, they were just fighting a bloke in what looked like a ski suit. So, um, and um, uh, Orlando Bloom said to me afterwards, he said, um, if when we'd had our sword fight, he said, if, if I'd seen a bigger picture of you um, looking like you really look, I think I might have acted a bit more scared because I wasn't scary, if you see what I mean. And that, it was actually more helpful. I mean, you don't know what you're looking like, so you kind of get an idea because they show you a sketch. But um, I, um, I don't suppose I'm an experienced that. And also there is a thing, isn't there, where you sit in front of a mirror and your character is built on your face, which actually makes you become that character to a certain extent. Did you feel that, Armin? No, about to say, but that's absolutely true. I didn't clear off it, you sort of left. Or I lost you somewhere. Over the yeah, it's, I, think, I think you're okay now, Armin. Hopefully we're okay. Um, just but certainly piece, sitting yes. in front of the mirror, uh, but certainly in front of the mirror was always inspiration. 
moment uh, the two people were connected on my head, the ask, I I was reminded, inspired, if you will, uh, of who my character was, mm -hmm. and um, and I I soon realized I didn't have to act the alien. If the makeup did all that that work for me, but it was an inspiration to see that in the mirror. Yes, you talked also in an interview about um, uh, a, a director, I believe, called Joss. Joss Whedon, not a director. Joss. He was a, re a director, but he was primarily a producer and a writer. You you said something really unusual and very very nice, and that was his in his relationship with all the actors on the set. Um, you could see that he was also learning something. He was learning how to deal with things. And I, I found that, that's collaboration again. And I found that a really charming thing for you to say about a director or a producer, in that case, a writer, producer. Um, but what exactly did you mean by he seemed to learn and grow from that? In, in what way? What, what, what exactly? Well, he later became a huge director for the Marvel films. But when I was working with him, uh, he was primarily a writer and, and creator. He had no skills. He had none of your skills, Graham, about directing. <laughs> Or working with you know, with with the actors personally, and and he learned. He he sat there, watched what the directors were doing, watched what all the crew people were doing, learn how to you know, to do their jobs to some extent, and 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 it inspired him to do exactly what you did, Graham, was to go from from one occupation to another, um, and he became not. He continued to be a great great writer, but also very well uh, uh, desirable director. As I said, he's done a number of the Marvel movies where he's directed those. Um, I, I liked him a great deal. Um, recently, there's been some chat about, uh, about how he related with some of the actresses on, this, on the set. I never saw any of that, but uh, I only knew him to be kind, supportive, uh, very shy, but also very funny. Much like Jonathan's experience of Johnny Depp, I believe, actually, in, in light of sort of recent scenarios. You never had any problems with Mr. Depp, did you, Jonathan? No, I mean, again, he was he was very shy. I mean, he was, um, like I think I mentioned last time I was on the show, um, um, when you work with somebody who's a, a, a movie star, they have this thing that they can switch on um, and give a performance that that isn't doesn't appear to be there before, like, five minutes before. In fact, uh, Johnny was almost invisible on the set until he became Jack Sparrow. And then he switched <laughs> something on and then he became this amazing character. And, um, and my experience of working with particularly great movie stars is that that, that happens, if you see what I mean. They have, a, they have an ability to switch something on. I don't know what it is, but uh, I've never had that. I, I, I have to try really hard all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I think not. <laughs> Certainly, uh, Jonathan, when you've appeared on stage, the moment before you're on stage, you are Jonathan. And then the moment you step on stage, you're Macbeth. You're Macbeth. Yes, absolutely. No, that's true. That's very true. Yes. And that's an experience. I mean, it, it, I, it's like driving a, a, a car um, and, and running up to the start of a Grand Prix, I suppose. And then you put your foot down when you go onto the, you know, the grid as it were, and shoot off. And, and that's, that's the experience of going on stage for me. But I, I, it's, it, if you do that on film, it looks like overacting. I always think, I mean, it's like trying too hard, if you see what I mean. Well, I, I will say, going back to Sarah Michelle Geller, she was quite capable of that. She could be <coughs> in a conversation, the director would yell action, and, he, and she would immediately become Buffy and, and do mm. what she had to do. It was amazing to watch her transform instantaneously that way. Um, I don't know how she did it. I, I, like yourself, Jonathan, I need a little bit of lead time to, yes. to do that. Uh, when I'm standing in the wings, ready to go <laughs> on, I use that time to get ready. Yeah. But, um, but she was quite capable of switching on a dime. I think it's a, I think it's a particular skill that some actors have and, um, and maybe that's what makes them the stars. The big stars, you know, not just character actors. 
I, I mean, I, 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 I mean I'm you're still a star, but to, not a character. I'm still trying, Jonathan, character. to get my notional head around this sign of how Seinfelds could have been improved if they'd only actually had photographs of what they were supposed to be spared <laughs> of on, on, on the sort of guest sort of star's chest. You know, it could have actually I'm helped. not so sure the actors on, on Seinfeld would have seen those pictures, even if it was right in front of them. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't looking, were they? They weren't looking. <laughs> no. um, I, I just wanted to say that um, it, it's amazing that the um, the the types of things that uh, Graham and Armin and Jonathan are talking about, um, like um, being able to switch something on or um, you know having a different kind of character, how similar it is to teaching in a way. Um, you know, because I'm a, a very different person um, before I go into the classroom, but as soon as I enter that that environment, it's like a like a switch flicks, and then I'm this this character, this lecturer. Um, full powers, but you know, at home or anywhere else, I'm completely. I know, think it's the person. same. And I, yeah, yeah, I, it does feel like um, you know, like acting. Um, in a way, I do say that. Um, people say, "Oh, you, you're very good, very professional." I say, "Actually, no, I'm completely disorganized." <laughs> <laughs> and then. It and it opens up a whole very, new world. I mean, you know, Jessica very, has never actually seen me in my secret identity, obviously, of the, sort of, <laughs> the average sort of uh, superhero teacher. I don't know. Maybe you have. I don't know. It's 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 a different line, which we can certainly go on to follow. I have to say, Paul, I'm very impressed with the fact that you wore the T-shirt with powers quite literally upon yourself, so we would actually know who yeah, you were, which you. is great. Paul, powers, <laughs> T-shirt there. It's a kind of flash routine. Uh, we also have to say congratulations to Paul once again. Uh, he became a father literally just, I think, eight days ago now or nine days ago, Congrats, Paul. Right? Congratulations. Uh, Congratulations. Uh, well, congratulations. You. You've got fun. Yeah, I have a. Are you sleeping? I have, you a, sleeping? I have two, two, two daughters now. Oh, I'm sorry, Armin, say that again. I'm are, they, are you getting to sleep? No. <laughs> <laughs> Is it any no, wonder he couldn't actually get the microphone um, turned up, Armin? He's not getting any sleep. So let's just leave <laughs> some slack, for goodness sakes. Uh, we've got a. Right, I've, but I've, I've got some coffee here <laughs> in my, in my Josh, Josh Whedon cup. <laughs> Well, thank God it wasn't a Seinfeld um, club, is all I can yeah. say, Paul. Otherwise, we'd, we'd have you off the show straight away. Um, I'd have to do I, a spit take. Yeah, I wonder, do we, do we have time for, um, for like a couple more questions? Or are we, we, are we we're actually, we're going to have to sort of wrap up. Unless you've got one very quick one, Paul. Yeah. Go for it. Quick one. Okay. I, I, I just wanted to ask Armin if he's ever mistaken in the street or wherever he goes for Jonathan Banks. Does he, do you know who Jonathan Banks I is? I certainly do know who Jonathan Banks is. Yeah, uh, I, I have never worked with him, but when we were young men, uh, we were both involved with a small theater here in Los Angeles. Um, and I, I watched him rehearse. He didn't know I was watching him rehearse. I was quite taken with him. He's a very fine actor, a very fine actor. I um, think it's you been... could do uh, like a twin sequel with the, the two of you together. Uh, I suppose, I suppose we could. Yes, there is a similarity, <laughs> but but over the course of my career, I've seen a lot of actors who look a lot more like me than I do Jonathan from the Banks. Yeah. I mean, it's been awesome connecting with you, good self, once again. Uh, next week, actually, Graham's going to be joining us on a call to uh, Patricia Tarman in Hawaii, where she's currently sort of heading wow. off to, from that point of view. Obviously, we thank Patricia for, for connecting you with us in the first place. Have you had a reasonably interesting Zuma this time around? Has it been good for you, Armin Shimmerman? Yes, it has. And please give my love to Pat, uh, who is responsible for my being here today. And also a, a lovely, lovely actress. Uh, she worked on Star Trek, and my wife worked on Babylon Five, and and we and our paths have crossed many, many, many times. Absolutely. So, will you return to another midweek drive, Armin? Can you come back and probably deal with those questions Paul is still keen to ask? <laughs> uh, yes, uh, uh, certainly. And let's do it before his daughters get too old. <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan, has it been good for you? It's been great, and it's been fantastic to meet Graham again, to see and Jess you, again, Jonathan. to see uh, Paul again, and 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 to meet Armin. So it's been fantastic. Thank you very much indeed for inviting me. Excellent. Thanks. So to your good self, Graham, of course, uh, as ever, a regular uh, good time. Yeah, absolutely smashing. Excellent. Nice to meet you all. It's lovely. Back, back again in a few moments, actually, with yourself and Jessica. Paul, take care. Keep on keeping on. Thank and you. we say, if you haven't got a hold of Armin Chimmerman's latest book, get it now. It's Illyria. Well worth accessing. Awesome tale of John D. Armin Chuman, Paul Powers, Jessica Burtis, Graham Harper, Jonathan Lindsley. We salute you. Take care now. <laughs>